for the grace of Jesus? Is anybody thankful for the cross and what it means to them? I want to say well done to Jin. It takes a lot of courage to step up here and talk about what the cross means to him. Come on, let's give Jin a hand. I know that encouraged me. We're just going to take a moment. You guys can grab your seats. Take a moment just to talk about some thoughts around tonight's Revive Night. This is the year of release. We're believing God is going to release favor and health and strength over His church. And If you're here this morning, I talked on the prodigal son. I want to encourage you. We're starting a new series called Radical Love. Radical Love as we build up to Easter. And I want to encourage you to get hold of the message from this morning as we unpack this. But tonight, I want to go to the book of Acts chapter 1 just for a few minutes. And then we're going to head back in some worship. If you're part of the soul track, you guys can head out now. Your program's beginning. Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' ministry on earth was finished. They'd received knowledge, the people on earth, they'd received messages, seen miracles. And for three years, they'd been sitting under the ministry of Jesus himself. Not only spiritually, but naturally too. And Jesus, their fearless leader, has ascended back into heaven to be with his Father. And they were left alone on earth to be ambassadors of Christ. Now the disciples had two options at this point. Option number one, in fact they were at a crossroads. Humanity was at a crossroad. Option number one, they could bury their heads and mourn or they could make a decision to respond. And this is what their response was. I mean, imagine being on earth with Jesus. And then Jesus suddenly just disappears in an instant, and they've got a choice. Forget the last three years, or start a love revolution on earth. And this is the very start of the church in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Every day, verse 46, they continued, they met together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor. And it said, the Lord added daily to those who were being saved. The early church was growing rapidly. It says 3,000 people in one day became followers of Jesus. Who would love that to happen in Norwich? I'd love to see that in my lifetime. 3,000 people in one day became followers of Christ. Now, the question I'm asking us tonight is why? Why was this happening? Did they have a great senior pastor? I can't see that. Did they have an awesome production gear? I can't see that. Did they even have a church building? We're not sure about that. Did they have Chunky the Monkey? What about their youth program? What about, what about the amazing sausage rolls? Maybe it was that. They had nothing compared to what we have today, yet the church grew rapidly. So I'm asking myself, what was it about the early church that's different to our church? Often we base so much of what we think will grow the church in all the wrong areas. If we just had another £100,000, we could invest here, we could invest there. If we just had 10 more staff, if we just had 10 more leaders, maybe we could do so much more. But the early church had none of that. And I realized this, that the same God who birthed the early church is the same God who is alive today and he's a part of this church here in Norwich, Norfolk. The same God that saw Reinhard Bonnke a few years ago, I think I've got a picture, speak to over one million people, one million people in one service, is exactly the same God that you and I worshipped here tonight. So what is the difference? What is the difference? I'm going to give you the difference. Are you ready? Three words. The answer to this question lies in the very first three words 
tonight that we spoke about. It's this. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. They had an intense personal devotion to the Lord. Devotion. They came back to consecration, which is to be set apart for God. I don't know about you, but when I heard the word devotion, it's a positive word. You think of a mother who's devoted herself to her child. We think about the devoted dad, takes time off work to be his child's sports team. I remember for me, my dad, he, he never liked football, but he always came to watch me play football because there was a devotion. Devotion. When my dad was in hospital with leukemia, I'll never forget the incredible NHS staff who were so devoted to their profession and so devoted for the care and the love of people. And you see, devoted people can never be satisfied with their current level of devotion. We can never be satisfied to our level of devotion to my kids. I'm constantly thinking, how can I be more devoted to my two children? And when it comes to God, I'm thinking, God, how can I be more devoted to you. You know, a mother is never going to say, you know, kids, I'm devoted enough. That's my limits. A devoted surgeon is never going to say, I'm done. I'm not going to grow in these skills anymore, but he's going to continue to try new equipment, to stay on the cutting edge of his industry, to move further faster. I believe as a church, we've continually got to be pursuing, pushing forward our devotion to God. And the Apostle Paul, he challenges us. He talks about this, they devoted themselves. And he talks about in four specific areas where we can grow and become more devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Number one is this. He says in the Apostles' teaching. That is commitment to God's Word. The early church, they loved the Bible. You know, I absolutely love this book, the Bible. I love it for so many reasons. One, it brings strength to my life. One, it brings comfort. And the other is it brings direction. And there's lots of ways that God speaks to us. God can speak to you through nature. God can speak to you through prayer. God can speak to you in so many different ways. But one of the main ways that God likes to speak to us is through his Bible. So when we're not picking it up or we're struggling to pick it up and we're saying, God, you never speak to me, often it's not on him, it's on us. And I love books. I love podcasts. I think we we have so much with the information age, aren't we? So much information coming out as commentaries and devotions. But there is no substitute for the Bible. Everything else is second-hand information. God's Word is truth. And I want it fresh from the source. That's why it's described as bread. I love bread. I love, I'm running a lot at the moment, and I absolutely love bread. I am devouring it. And I love the smell of bread. But here's the deal there is nothing worse than old bread. Has anyone ever. Do you know every day the Father has fresh bread? Fresh bread. You know, tomorrow's bread isn't ready, it's still in flour form. Yesterday's bread is finished, but today's bread, every day. Give us today our daily bread. God's got daily bread to nourish you and feed you. The question is this, will you open the bread bin? And if you haven't read your Bible for a while, I'm not here to condemn you right now. I just pray you're feeling hungry. Because God wants to feed you. God wants to nourish you. And Chantal and I's prayer for this church is that we would fall in love again with our Bibles. Can I encourage you, when you cannot hear God, read God. Read God. God's Word is alive. And don't just read it, speak it out. Speak it out. Every day I say certain prayers, like the Lord's Prayer and the prayer of Jabez and David's prayer. The Lord is my shepherd. I speak it out because I want to get it into my spirit. I want to encourage you to write it on post-it notes. Put it all over your bathroom. Put it all over. But get God's Word. Whatever way you get it, get it into your heart. Get it into your spirit. I encourage you, get a plan. Get a plan. A lot of people say, I really struggle with the Bible. It's a big book. It's complicated. and It's not even chronologically written. And I get all that. But get a plan. 
One of my plan, how I read the Bible might work for you. I read one chapter of the Old Testament, one chapter of the New Testament, one chapter of Psalms, and one chapter of Proverbs every day. And it takes about 15 minutes. And it's just a little way for me to remember how to work through the Bible. Maybe you like to go digital. Can I encourage you? Download version, the Bible app. Have it on your phone. Have it on your iPad, on your tablet. Encourage you daily. And don't, don't just read the word, but if you, the next level is to apply the word. And so we have this thing called soap. I know you youth do it. Soap. Everyone say soap. <laughs> Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. And take God's word and read a scripture and observe it. Say, God, what are you trying to say to me through this? And what do you want me to apply it to my life? And then pray over it. And it's a simple template to grow in God's word. The second area that the early church grew is they, the Bible says they grew in fellowship. What is that community with one another? First thing they did is they were devoted to their Bibles. The second thing is they were devoted to having community with one another. Fellowship for them wasn't just a quick catch up in the cafe. They had true devotion to one another. I think community can shape and find itself in so many different ways. I think we're heading into a great season with our new soul groups. And I want to encourage you to be part of a smaller community. We always say we're a a small church with a lot of people. But you've got to find your smallness in the bigness of what God is doing here. I encourage you, if you're not in a small group, to grab yourself uh, uh, some time afterwards and get yourself signed up in a small group. Because we cannot survive outside of community. You were not designed to do this alone. And the early church had this devotion to one another. Join a group. Start a group. You say, well, maybe there's not a group on there for me. Start a group. Maybe you love playing Scrabble. Start a Scrabble group. Not a squabble group, a Scrabble group. (laughs) Maybe you you, you like playing football. We've got football groups. We've got cycling groups. We've got so many different groups. We want to encourage you. One of the ways that you can be devoted is to find community like the early church. Another way you can find community is be part of one of our teams. Join a team. Join a team. Be part of it. Don't sit on the outside. Come on in to the inside. You know, through, through Soul Foundation, we heard a great story of the YMCA tonight. Our team heads into the YMCA every week and does some incredible training and programs with the, with, with the young, young adults in there. I encourage you to be part of that. Also, I want to encourage you, know, another way you can find community, and this is a really challenging one, is be in someone's crisis. Whose crisis are you in right now? You say, well, John, I've got my own crisis. I want to encourage you to be in someone else's crisis. You say, well, I don't feel, I don't feel I'm a, you know, good enough to be in someone. You know, sometimes it's just a text message. Sometimes it's, we can all send a text message. We can all pick up a phone. You don't have to have all the skills to encourage someone. I encourage you, find, find a crisis. Be part of the solution. Maybe it's just a shoulder to, be, to cry on. Maybe it's someone who's going through financial difficulties and you can help bring some direction. Maybe it's in grief. I remember when I lost my dad. A few years ago, a gentleman from South Africa, he was in in the UK and he drove all the way to Norris to see me on my dad's anniversary. He said, I just wanted to be here for you today. I thought, wow, isn't that incredible? He wasn't necessarily the most skilled man in the world, but all he wanted to be was to say, I'm devoted. And the, the question is this, Whose crisis am I walking through with someone? You know, often we want solutions, don't we? We want solutions to problems, but sometimes there is no solution to the problem. Often the solution is simply compassion. And maybe all you have to offer, I don't have all the solutions to your problems. Maybe your world is falling to bits right now, but what we can offer, just as the early church, is we can offer compassion. And sometimes, this is what Chantal I've realized, is compassion is the solution. Sometimes the solution, we can't turn back the clock. We can't, but the solution could be that we're there for one another. Wouldn't it be amazing if the church got back to the early church where we had compassion on one another? Where we weren't so caught up in our own our own plight and our own trying to get to the next thing, but actually we stopped like the Good Samaritan. And we were genuinely interested in the others, in others. They had a devotion to the word of God. They had devotion to one another. And number three is they had a devotion to communion with Jesus. Breaking of bread. 
On the night Jesus was betrayed, knowing was about to be, what was about to take place, he instituted what has become known now as the Lord's Supper. Jesus' final meal with his disciples on earth. As the worship team come up, we're going to receive communion together. Because I, I want us tonight to almost, I want us to fall in love with these four things again. Fall in love with, you know, John, this isn't very, maybe it sounds a little elementary tonight. But I want to encourage you, this is what is attractive to others. When our lives are aligned up with, words, with the Word of God. When we're in community with one another. And thirdly, the power of communion. You know, communion, it symbolizes, it signifies three things. Number one is remembrance. It's all about remembering Jesus. Be conscious of everything that Christ did in our place. We proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. The second thing communion represents, it represents wholeness. Jesus was broken, He was bruised, He was beaten so that we could live whole. This is our healing. And thirdly, it symbolizes forgiveness. See, it's not until we realize that we're forgiven that we're able to forgive others. When we receive communion, we understand the forgiveness of God afresh. His, his body broken for us. His blood that was shed for us. And we're declaring today again that we are forgiven. When you receive communion, you're not asking God to forgive you. You are forgiven. It was a finished work. But you are remembering again who you are in Christ. I want to encourage us not to limit communion to the first Sunday of every month. 1 Corinthians says, for as often as you meet together. You can begin to hand out the emblems tonight. In the Norman household, we have communion on a Monday evening with our kids. Because we don't want communion just to become a part of church. We want it to become part of our everyday life. And the children, they ask us last night, we forgot to have it on Monday. And they asked us, they say, Daddy, can we have communion tonight? It's becoming part of because we want to remember Jesus. I want to encourage you as parents, gather the family around. Just pull them in for five minutes and have communion with one another and remember Jesus. Communion, it makes us Jesus-focused, not self-focused. It's not everything about us. It's everything about Him. For as often as you meet together. Maybe as a soul group this week, you can receive communion together. Maybe before you have dinner with your family you receive communion maybe you'll be at a party you have communion I think there's something so special and sacred about communion I pray it never just becomes a religious act in our church but actually it becomes an everyday part of our lives once you've got the little piece of bread which represents his body and the little cup of juice just hold on to it would you stand with us together? We're going we're gonna to receive this together as a church family. This is a meal. This is a meal that we're partaking of together. And remembering Jesus and all that he's done for us. This is a part of our devotion to him. I want you just to close our eyes just for a moment. This bread represents brokenness. Represents maybe right now you're feeling under the weather, you're feeling sick, maybe you're carrying some sort of disease virus. Right now we're going to remember his body broken so we could be made whole. So that we could walk in health and strength. Let's eat together. Remember Jesus. cup of juice represents his blood. Right now, let's drink together and remember that we're forgiven. We're clean tonight because of Jesus. Why don't you, just in your own words, begin to say thank you to him. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we're so grateful for your blood. So grateful for your gift of your son Jesus on that cross. Thank you God. Thank you Lord.
for the cross. Father, we thank you again for your grace towards us. Thank you for your love, your unmerited favor, your goodness in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can just take your seats for a couple more moments. The early church, as it gathered momentum, had a 
intense devotion to God's Word and an intense devotion to community with one another, to Holy Communion and finally, prayer. Connection with God. It might have been the final devotion in this passage, but it It's the foundation to every devotion in our life, prayer. Prayer accesses us to the presence of God. Jesus said, he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. As right now as a church, we need prayer. We need prayer for the future. We need prayer as individuals. We need prayer. There's never been a time in history where our government needs the prayer. There's never been a time in history where our nation needs prayer. It's very easy right now to point fingers. It's very easy to have opinions. Let me tell you, we're entitled to those opinions. They're not always helpful, but we're entitled to them. There's one thing that's going to help this nation. There's one thing that's going to help our marriages, our families. That's prayer. I always feel better after praying, but I tell you what, it's really difficult to get to that point because we live in a very distractive world. There's things constantly coming towards us, social media, kids, everything distracting because the enemy knows if he can distract us from prayer, he can almost put a stop on our lives because prayer, it builds us up. It's like protein. It makes you strong and it helps you grow. I want to encourage us this week to have a fresh determination to prayer. Maybe you feel like you can only pray in a certain time, in a certain way. Prayer doesn't work like that. Prayer is like a relationship. You can talk to God at any time, anywhere, about anything. I think that's pretty special. You can tell God how many times you've messed up this week. You can tell Him all about your bad thoughts. You can tell Him all the good things. You can tell Him anything He wants, anything you want. And guess what? He can handle it. He can really handle it. I've had a lot of time running recently, and I've spoken to God about a lot of stuff. I got mad at Him. There was times I even got angry. I had a few real frustrations that come out, and God's like, I can handle it. Keep it coming. Chantel might not be able to handle it all. My kids can't, but Jesus can. And that's exactly what prayer is. It's simply speaking to the Father. You don't have to look a certain way, point a certain way. You don't have to shut your eyes, open your eyes, put your hands up, put your hands. It doesn't matter. Anything of that, a lot of that's just rooted in religion. Prayer is simply talking to God. It's just having a conversation talking to Him about the good things, thanking Him, talking to Him about the challenges, talking about the frustrations. And God is saying, I love it. He absolutely loves it when we consecrate ourselves to Him through prayer. So this week, I've been challenged. As I was putting this message together yesterday, I am challenged in these four areas. Because I believe as us, as a community, if we can fall in love again with those four devotions, there is no reason that we cannot see a move of God in this city like they did in Acts chapter 2. Now I want to go right here. Devotion always pays dividends. Acts chapter 2 verse 47, the last verse, it says this, And the Lord added daily to those who are being saved. Daily. I think if we can return... If one week we walked in here and like tonight, some of the microphones necessary didn't work and the screen goes out and there's no smoke and there's no chairs, we can walk in here and we can still experience a serious move of God because God's presence is not attracted to things, it's attracted to people. And let me tell you, there's going to be a greater awakening to come in our city and our nation when people realize it's not about the lights, it's not about the sound, it's not about how we dress, it's not about how we look, it's about when our hearts connect with His heart. It's about when we get back to the basics and we say, God, I need your word. God, I need your strength. God, I need your prayers. God, I need you like never before. So why don't we strip it all back and go back to the heart of why we do it. Come on, let's sing, let's worship, and let's declare it's 
written is it is a church that devoted themselves because that was what was written of the early church three words they devoted themselves this week I've got a commitment to devotion to myself a lot of people say it's your responsibility my responsibility as your pastor is not to grow you it's to love you we've got to take a personal responsibility to grow ourselves and how do we do that it's really simple through the Bible, through communion, through prayer, and through community with one another. I think if we apply those four things to our lives, it won't be easy, but we'll get through. So if you're saying tonight, John, I want a fresh commitment to one or two or three or maybe all four of those areas, but you're saying, I want a fresh commitment to my devotion to Jesus. I want just to lift your hand. I want to pray for you. This is personal between you and God. Father, we read the early church, the mandate on them. As you left, Father, and you left the, the disciples to pioneer the greatest movement in history, the local church. We see it grew rapidly and lives were changed, Father, but it wasn't because of all the things we thought it was. It was because they had this devotion to you. And I pray this week, Lord, despite the distractions and the things around us, Father, we would get back to these devotions, Father. To sit in your word, to speak to you through prayer, to remember you through communion. Find community with one another. Lord, I pray you'd place a fresh desire in us today. Fresh desire, Father God, to pray, to speak to you. Lord, I pray for those who feel away from you. They feel like they're disconnected. They feel like they've lost relationship. God, I pray even this week, you have given the opportunity to go for a walk and speak to you again. Head to the beach, Father. Do some way to connect again with the Father. with everyone's head bowed and everyone's eyes closed. You've been saying, John, tonight, I've never made a decision to follow Jesus. I've been living life on my own. I've been heading through life trying to figure this all out. And I keep, keep, keep hitting roadblocks. But tonight, I sense there's something different. What you sense is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is here. He wants to help you. He wants to help you go through life. You weren't designed to go through life on your own. But with Him, He's here tonight. He loves you. Maybe you don't feel good enough. Here's the good news. None of us are good enough. That's why Jesus died on a cross. He took our place. He took our shame. He took our sin so that we could walk and live in freedom. I'd love to pray for you. Maybe you once made a decision to follow Jesus. You disconnected. Tonight, you can come home. The Father's arms are wide open. You've got to make that decision to receive His love. And I'm going to count to three in all of this room. You say, John, I want to connect for the first time or I want to reconnect with Jesus tonight. I want to make Him Lord of my life. All I want you to do all over this room from front to the back. You just slip up your hand long enough and high enough so I can see it. I want to pray for you. 
One, he loves you. Two, would you have the courage to respond to his love? Three, just slip it up nice and high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Beautiful. Anyone else? Say that's me tonight. God bless you. Good on you. Good on you. Maybe you're watching online. This is for you in this time, wherever you are in the world right now. You can be sitting in your office, sitting in your bedroom. God is connecting with you. You don't have to be in church in a church building to speak to God, to connect with God. He is everywhere. He is omnipresent. We're going to say a really simple but powerful prayer to connect us to God right now. We're going to let go of our old life and step into a brand new life with Him. We're going to say this prayer as a family out loud together. Dear Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you that he died for me. Thank you that he shed his blood so that I could have life. Tonight, I acknowledge my need of you. I open up my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a brand new start. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, everyone in the room, everyone online, let's congratulate them. Thanks again for tuning in. If you said the salvation prayer today, we'd love for you to email connecttofaith at soulchurch.com so we can talk a little bit more about this incredible decision that you've just made. And if at any point in the service you felt moved to give to any of our local or global initiatives, then head to soulchurch.com and click on giving at the top of the page. We're so glad you tuned in today and we hope to see you again soon. God bless.